Hello, everyone. My name is Laz Boros, and I'm the president of the Thard Foundation of Canada. I'd like to welcome you to our April Public Education webinar. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Kelsey Roloffs, who will be speaking on thyroid eye disease. Dr. Roloffs completed her medical education and residency training at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Following this, she embarked on a year ocular oncology fellowship at Moore Moorefields Eye Hospital. She's currently completing an American Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles. She has published over 40 peer reviewed papers, 19 textbook chapters, and was the 2021 recipient of the Bartley R. Frew Research Award. Our presentation has been completed. Once the, the presentation has been completed, Dr. Rolos will answer questions from the audience. Catherine Keene, our administrator, will be acting as producer for this webinar. This means she will be managing the technical aspects of Zoom. Some of our board directors will also be assisting. Anista Primachardran will be looking after the Q&A section. Lori Martin will assist us in the chat room. This event will be recorded and made available on our website later this week. A little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Today, we are using the webinar functionality of Zoom. This means that you can see and hear all the presenters and chat chat with other attendees, but your audio and camera are not active and we are not using the raised hand feature. The good news is that the Q&A feature is active and you can use it to ask your questions after the presentation has finished. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please reach out to Catherine via the chat feature. At this point, we are ready to begin with Dr. Kelsey's, uh, Kelsey Rolos presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Laz. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. So it's, it's my uh, privilege and my pleasure to be talking with you today about thyroid eye disease. I'm a Canadian, although I'm temporarily in the United States right now at uh, UCLA. I think um, one of the things I'm hoping to convey to you throughout this presentation is some of the differences between uh, how different systems manage thyroid eye disease, because that's been an interesting thing for me to see throughout fellowship training. So this is a little bit of what we'll go over. We'll start with an introduction about what thyroid eye disease is, discuss some of the epidemiology and the pathophysiology, and then really we'll spend the bulk of our time going over the clinical features and then the approach to treatment. So as you may have realized, if you've done any reading on the internet about thyroid eye disease, it comes by many names. They all essentially mean the same thing. It's just a difference in nomenclature. But for the purpose of this talk, I'll be referring to the disease as thyroid eye disease or TED. So TED is an autoimmune condition. It's often, but not always, associated with Graves disease. It's really diagnosed based on a characteristic constellation of clinical features. So there's not one specific blood test that can diagnose you with TED or even one specific clinical exam finding that can say you certainly have TED. It's a combination of many things. One of the most important messages that I wanna get across to you today is that both how we diagnose and how we approach management of TED depends on stage and grade. So when I'm talking about stage, I mean active or inactive disease, and we'll get into that more during the presentation. And then grade is really a description of the severity of disease. And then finally, treatments, both medical and surgical, they're really guided by both the stage and the grade of disease. In terms of the epidemiology, about 90% of patients who have TED will have Graves disease. That means that there's about 6% who are euthyroid. So even though they have this clinical constellation that's in keeping with thyroid eye disease, they don't have any systemic laboratory evidence of thyroid dysfunction. And about 4% of people with TED will have Hashimoto's disease or primary hypothyroidism. So who are these 90% of people with TED who have Graves' disease? Well, of everyone who is diagnosed with Graves, about 20 to 50% of them will go on to develop eye disease. Now, these patients are more commonly female. Although the caveat to that is that males with thyroid eye disease tend to have more severe disease. 
there's no reported ethnic predisposition, and the average age of onset is what we call bimodal. So there's a peak in the younger ages around 30, and then another peak around 50. One important thing to know is that TED generally presents within about 18 months of the systemic diagnosis with Graves' disease. So if you were diagnosed with Graves' disease 10 or 15 years ago, it's very, very highly unlikely that you'll have any issues with TED at this point. The pathophysiology of thyroid eye disease is somewhat complicated, but really over the last few years, we've learned a lot more about it. And specifically, we've identified the importance of the insulin-like growth factor signaling pathway in the pathophysiology of TED. So the IGF-1 receptor and the TSH receptor, they're located together on the fibroblasts, which are um, cells within the orbit that can produce substances like glycosaminoglycans, which draw in water and cause swelling, and also can cause expansion of orbital tissues such as the fat and the muscle. And together, these things give us the clinical features of thyroid eye disease. So with that said, let's get into the clinical features themselves. As I've now said probably three times already, you can tell it's an important message to drive home. It's really about this constellation of signs and symptoms that leads us to the clinical diagnosis of thyroid eye disease. So the upper eyelids are a good place to start because upper eyelid retraction is very commonly seen in thyroid eye disease and not very commonly seen with any other entity. So it's something that we call um, a specific sort of indicator of thyroid eye disease. You can see the person in the top photo who does not have TED. We call this measurement where the red line is the MRD, margin reflex distance one. So from the center of the pupil up to the edge of the eyelid. And you'll appreciate that in the bottom photo, the patient who has TED has a significantly increased MRD one. Now it's not just the eyelid position that's abnormal. It's also the eyelid contour. So this is referred to as lateral flare. You can appreciate that the person in the top photo has more of an almond shape to her eyes, whereas the patient in the bottom photo has a much more rounded configuration of the upper eyelid. Now you may be asking yourself because there's all sorts of variations in eyes. And this is one of the things that I find so fascinating about oculoplastic surgery is that there's a lot of variability in eyelids. And so you might wonder, well, perhaps this patient always had a rounded upper eyelid configuration. But one thing that's really helpful when you go in to see your ophthalmologist wondering about thyroid eye disease is to bring an old photograph of yourself. It's helpful for a few reasons because number one, it helps us identify changes that have happened over time. And number two, especially from an oculoplastic surgery standpoint, it helps us counsel you better about what steps would be needed in order to rehabilitate you as close to your pre-thyroid eye disease stage as possible. Of course, sometimes things improve on their own. And so you can see the patient in the top photo, she has relatively mild upper eyelid retraction and lateral flare compared to the patient on the previous slide. And over 15 years of follow-up, that relaxed and loosened up. So just because you have some eyelid features of thyroid eye disease, certainly doesn't mean you necessarily need surgery to fix them, especially if they're mild like this, they can sometimes improve on their own. Now the lower eyelid can also become retracted in thyroid eye disease, although that's due to slightly different mechanisms. You can appreciate here that this patient's eyes themselves are bulging forward. And so you can imagine that it's difficult for the lower eyelid to climb up a hill against gravity. And so as you develop more proptosis or your eyes bulge forward more, the lower eyelid often sits at a lower position and you see this white scleral show beneath the colored iris. Edema and or erythema are also common signs of thyroid eye disease. This would typically be seen in the active phase, although certainly some edema can last throughout the inactive phase, especially if there's difficulties with draining the venous blood from the eye socket if things are really tight but this would be an indicator for me of active disease, the amount of inflammation in that photo. Now we briefly mentioned this when we were talking about lower eyelid retraction, but because you have a fixed bony orbit, so the space that the orbit can hold is fixed, it doesn't really expand. And thyroid eye disease causes an increase in the volume of the fat and the muscle, things have nowhere to go but forward. And so as this progresses, you develop more proptosis. This is what's called a worm's eye view. And you can appreciate that compared to the, the patient in the top photo, 
The patient in the bottom photo, her eyes are um, coming forward much further. Restricted motility and strabismus is also something that's commonly seen in thyroid eye disease. And this patient displays a relatively characteristic pattern of those things in particular. So in the top photo, we call this strabismus because she's trying to look straight ahead, but her eyes are not aligned. <clears throat> Sorry. So she would be having double vision, looking straight ahead. And what you can appreciate is that the right eye is actually pointed down a little bit. And this is because the most commonly involved muscle in thyroid eye disease is the inferior rectus. So when it becomes enlarged and fibrotic, it prevents the eye from moving up. And you can appreciate that that is the case when you look at the other photos in the photo right in the middle that says restricted motility. She's trying to look up, her left eye is looking up, but her right eye can't get up beyond the midline. Now, the other thing that's characteristic about this is that the upper eyelid is retracted mainly just on that one side. And that happens because the muscle that moves your eyeball up and the muscle that moves your eyelid up, they're linked, they work together. Think about trying to look up without letting your eyelid go up. It's not really possible to do that. The two work together. And so this is a case of secondary retraction where just operating on the muscle alone may be enough to put the eyelid in a better position because those superior muscles won't have to work as hard to overcome the tight inferior muscle. Now there's some ocular surface features that we can see in thyroid eye disease. This is demonstrating chemosis. Chemosis is basically a swelling of the most superficial layer of the eye, the conjunctiva. It's also demonstrating some injection, right? You can appreciate that there's some redness. And even more in this photo, you see that there's some localized redness medially. So all of these things are graded. And when you go for your follow-up exams, most um, ophthalmologists will keep sort of a scored system running so that we know if each of these conditions is improving or getting worse or staying about the same. And again, that gives us a better overall sense of what is happening with your disease. Now, sometimes the eyes become so proptotic that the eyelids can't close properly over them. And in addition to just the proptosis, if you have a lot of upper eyelid retraction, sometimes the eyelids can't relax enough to close. You can see on the top photo that her eyes are, you know, still probably two and a half millimeters open when she's trying to close them in sort of a relaxed way like you might when you sleep. And so you can imagine that if that's the case, the surface of the eye might dry out. And that's what we're showing in the bottom photo. This is a photo taken from the slit lamp. The slit lamp is a microscope that we use to look at the surface of the eye. And a dye has been instilled. This is called fluorescein. And basically the dye stains any areas where the superficial layer has broken down. So at the bottom part of the circle, the cornea there, you see all of that stippled staining that would be in keeping with exposure keratopathy. Another thing that you can get is called superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. And this is basically an inflammatory condition where you have injection located superiorly and you have a very um, irritating foreign body sensation. It feels like something is stuck under your upper eyelid. Now, superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis can be seen on its own. It's not necessarily a feature of thyroid eye disease but the two do go together, not infrequently. So it's something that we check our thyroid eye disease patients for quite carefully. The bottom photo is um, demonstrating staining with lysamine green, and this is helpful for picking up some very subtle cases of SLK. And then the final thing I'd like to go over is some of the periorbital changes. This is something that wasn't really discussed much when I was in residency training, but it's something that at UCLA, we really have done a lot of research on and looking at um, because some of the changes in the fat extend beyond just the fat in the orbit and involve the fat around the eyes in the eyebrow region. Um, and you get this thickening or coarsening sort of appearance. This is kind of a double-edged sword because in one sense, it's difficult to treat this. It's not easy to surgically remove it in a aesthetically pleasing way. And so oftentimes, you know, patients need to be patient with this feature. But the good news or the exciting part of this is that it seems to age patients less. So patients with thyroid eye disease who have some of this periorbitopathy is what we call it, over a 10 year period, they seem to age less than their counterparts. 
we're doing a study right now using artificial intelligence to run a series of photos through and those are what our preliminary results are so that's exciting now of course imaging plays an important role in our evaluation of somebody that we suspect of having thyroid eye disease on the top image this is an mri you can appreciate that the extraocular muscles which are all these um, little enhancing spots within both orbits they look like a pretty normal size but in the bottom they look dramatically different and there's a lot of inflammatory stranding within the eye socket itself the lacrimal gland which is the gland that produces your tears can also become enlarged in thyroid eye disease as you can see um, shown by the arrows here and so i know i i made a comment earlier that the bony cavity doesn't expand well, I guess there is an asterisk beside that because it can expand it a small amount. Some studies have found that the medial wall can bow into the sinuses just a little bit. So this is a chronic feature of thyroid eye disease. And then this is a, I would say an under-recognized or under-reported feature is called periphlebitis of the superior ophthalmic vein. This is important because the superior ophthalmic vein drains all of the blood from the eye socket. And so inflammation in this vein might mean that it's not draining as well. And so the tissues back up with additional fluid and additional pressure. And so that um, seems to be present in about 5% of patients. Now, of course, the other side is the symptoms, right? So many of these things have corresponding symptoms because of you know, exposure keratopathy or superior limbic keratic conjunctivitis, you can develop tearing and foreign body sensation. Oftentimes patients complain of light sensitivity and dryness. And I know that all seems very counterintuitive. Your eyes are dry, but you're bothered by tearing. And the problem there is that your eyes become dry and they send a signal to produce more tears. And so your body does that, but those tears are not improving the problem. You know, in the case of leg ophthalmus, where the eyelids can't close all the way, no matter how many tears you produce, the surface is still going to be dry because the windshield wipers, the eyelids, they're not spreading the tears over those dry spots. And so even though your eyes are dry, they're still tearing, which is very frustrating for patients. And then, of course, you have symptoms secondary to the orbital um, aspects of the disease. This can include retrobulbar ache, where it feels like your eyes are really heavy and there's a lot of pressure behind them. Pain with eye movements, that's generally seen during the active phase of thyroid eye disease. And of course, double vision, which is probably one of the most debilitating symptoms I think that patients have because it can really prevent you from continuing to live your normal life, at least in the short term. So as you can see, there is a huge number of clinical signs and symptoms that we take into account when we're evaluating a patient for possible thyroid eye disease. So now that we've gone over all of that, let's discuss stage and grade. So I briefly mentioned earlier that there's sort of in general two stages of thyroid eye disease. We have the active stage and the inactive stage. In actuality, there is a third stage some people rarely will develop reactivation after a long period of inactivity, but the risk of that is less than 1%. So for the purposes of this talk, we'll focus on active and inactive. And then of course we have grade. So this is your mild, moderate, and severe. And different physicians use different criteria to put people into these categories. But in general, for me anyways, if someone has issues with extraocular motility or strabismus, that automatically makes them at least a moderate grade. And the severe is really reserved for people who are having progressive active disease or have problems with the optic nerve function. Um, and then, you know, mild can be anything from a little bit of irritation to mild eyelid retraction, that sort of thing. The active uh, phase generally lasts between 12 and 18 months. So you can see the, the picture on the left is this patient at presentation. He has a lot of injection, a lot of chemosis. You can tell just from looking at that one picture, if you knew that he had thyroid eye disease, that he's probably in the active phase. And then the photo on the right is him about a year and a half later. He's in the inactive phase now. He still has eyelid retraction, but his eyes are not nearly as red looking. And a lot of that swelling has gone away. The one thing 
that I tell all of my patients is that you should really, really try to stop smoking if you're a smoker. And if you're not, you should definitely not start because smoking is the number one modifiable risk factor that we have. It's really the only lifestyle change that has really outstanding top quality evidence. Smoking increases the severity of disease and it also prolongs the active period. And I would say from my clinical experience, smoking probably also increases the risk of reactivation down the line. So if you can kick the habit or avoid starting it, if you are not a smoker, that is tremendously to your benefit in thyroid eye disease. One other category that I really briefly wanna to touch on is dysthyroid optic neuropathy. So this is why when you go to see your ophthalmologist, if you're being monitored for thyroid eye disease, they're often checking your color vision with a little plate that looks like this with all those colored spots. And that's because dysthyroid optic neuropathy is one of the ways that thyroid eye disease can cause vision loss. Fortunately for all of us, most of this is reversible, especially if it's dealt with in a timely fashion. And so, you know, changes on the visual field, swelling of the nerve in the back of the eye, or even some uh, folds in the back of the eye suggestive of a lot of pressure back there can all be signs of dysthyroid optic neuropathy. And that should be treated in an expedient fashion. So let's get on to treatment then. In general, I think of treatment in these three categories. And for the most part, patients in the active phase of disease will be looking at supportive and medical treatments. And those in the inactive phase will be better surgical candidates. But of course, that's not an all or nothing rule. There are certain instances where surgery is necessary during the active phase, such as dysthyroid optic neuropathy if it is not responding to medical treatments. Now, you might ask yourself, why not do surgery for everybody in the active phase? Well, the issue is twofold. Number one, surgery is an insult that causes inflammation to get worse in general. So unnecessary surgery can cause your disease to be more severe or prolong your active phase. And number two is that it's very difficult to achieve as good of an outcome if you're aiming for a moving target. So for example, if today you are three millimeters proptotic and I do surgery to move your eyes back three millimeters without waiting for you to finish the active stage of disease, I'll never know if you were going to become seven millimeters proptotic and needed an entirely different surgery. So for those reasons, it's generally better to wait to the inactive phase for surgical rehabilitation. And similarly, there are some instances where medical treatment can be appropriate in inactive disease. We'll talk a little bit about tepratumumab today, and there is some emerging evidence that it may also be useful in patients with inactive disease. So the goals of treatment are really, they're different depending on the stage that you're in. When you're in the active phase of disease, our primary goal is to improve your symptomatology, to make you comfortable, and try to minimize the impact that thyroid eye disease has on your immediate quality of life. When you progress into the inactive phase, though, our goal is really to get you as close to what you were before you had thyroid eye disease. So whatever rehabilitation that means, if it means surgery or medicine, um, we work together to create a customized plan for that. In terms of supportive treatments, of course, artificial tears and lubricating ointment can be helpful. Anybody can use these and they're helpful to many people. So if you have some eye irritation, but you don't really think you have TED or, you know, your ophthalmologist doesn't think you do, there's no harm to using artificial tears. It might make you feel better. Selenium is one thing that actually does have a little bit of evidence, particularly in cases of mild active thyroid eye disease. So this is a supplement you can take 100 micrograms twice daily. And this study published in the New England Journal of Medicine found that it made a significant impact on the uh, patients with mild thyroid eye disease. So moving on to medical treatments, corticosteroids have really formed the backbone for medical treatment of thyroid eye disease for several decades. In general, we think that IV is better tolerated than oral, meaning that it has less side effects. But of course it carries with it a logistical challenge that you need to either go into an infusion facility once a week or have a home health care nurse come to your house once a week for infusions. And then of course, you know, many people are aware of the negative side effects of steroids. It can cause your blood sugar to go up. It can cause your blood pressure to go up. 
can give you worsening of anxiety and insomnia. And occasionally, if you really have a very, very high dose of steroids, greater than eight grams IV, you can have a risk of liver failure and cardiovascular events. So it's a great medication when you need to use it, but if you have minimal symptoms, it might be overkill to start with corticosteroids. Sorry. Rituximab. Rituximab is a chimeric human and most monoclonal antibody. It's against CD20. Now, there was one prospective study that looked at the use of rituximab in thyroid eye disease, and they found very promising and encouraging results. However, a follow-up similarly um, organized and you know, equal level of evidence study found contradictory results. So at the present time, um, I'm not really sure exactly where rituximab fits in the treatment paradigm, just because of the evidence that exists. I think it might have a role in patients who have severe corticosteroid resistant disease, um, but I think more remains to be known about the use of rituximab. Now, tocilizumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody. It's against the interleukin-6 molecule. And this has the advantage of coming in a pre-filled syringe that patients can inject on their own at home. So from a logistical standpoint, it's a bit easier. It might have a role in steroid-resistant cases similarly, but more research is really required to determine what the definitive role of tocilizumab is. And then, of course, tepertumumab. This is the hot topic that everybody wants to know about. I'm not sure, maybe less so in Canada, but in the United States, once it was approved, patients came in very frequently asking about it by name. So I'm just gonna go over some of the actual evidence for it because I think it's important to differentiate things you hear in marketing from things that are scientifically proven. So this is a humanized monoclonal antibody against the IGF-1 receptor. It was actually developed for use in cancer many, many years ago, and it wasn't a great anti-cancer drug. It didn't have uh, great efficacy, but it was reasonably tolerated. And so in the last few years, as the role of the IGF-1 signaling pathway has been implicated in thyroid eye disease, the medication was repurposed for TED. And as we went over before, the IGF-1 receptor and the TSH receptor they co-localized together on orbital fibroblasts. So this really formed the foundational hypothesis for why inhibiting the activation of this pathway might be helpful in thyroid eye disease. So this was the first prospective randomized placebo-controlled trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017. They compared tepertumumab to placebo and they looked at a few outcomes. So in terms of proptosis, the patients who got tepertumumab had a reduction of about two and a half millimeters compared to the control, which didn't change. The CAS is a scale that we use to describe the inflammatory features. So it summarizes many of the things we talked about in the beginning part of the lecture. It summarizes the uh, injection, the chemosis, the retrobulbar ache, or the pain with eye movement. And so they found that this decreased that score significantly. There is a quality of life questionnaire about vision and also about appearance. And they found improved scores on these surveys in the tepertumumab treated group. And finally, patients also reported an improvement in double vision. Although I will note that the double vision scale used in this study was an imperfect one. It really just has three grades, better, same, or worse. And so I think you miss a lot of the granularity in the data there. So then in 2020, the second prospective placebo-controlled trial came out, again published in New England Journal of Medicine, and they found pretty similar results to the first study. Again, proptosis reduction was about two and a half, the inflammatory scale decreased, and overall, they felt that 78% of patients responded to treatment with tepertumumab. They also had improvements of these quality of life scales and in the diplopia score. One thing though to note is that tepertumumab is undoubtedly not without its side effects. Some of these are mechanism related and directly caused by inhibiting the IGF-1 signaling pathway. And this includes hearing loss, um, which appears to be a significant problem if you have pre-existing hearing loss. And then other side effects are nonspecific like diarrhea, muscle aches or cramps. Um, what I would say from my personal experience with tepertumumab is that almost everybody has at least one side effect, but 
fortunately, most of them are mild, but not all. You know, although none of the patients in these trials discontinued therapy, we've had a handful of patients who've discontinued treatment after three or four infusions because they felt that the side effects were not tolerable. So the final thing I want to talk about is this summary of thyroid eye disease in 2020. I thought this was a really great paper, and it highlights the tremendous difference in cost between traditional treatment, which is sort of your IV methylprednisolone, your corticosteroids, which runs about $500 per treatment, and tepertumumab, which runs about $200,000 per treatment, more depending on how much you weigh because it's a weight-based uh, dosing. And so I think that's just another thing that needs to be taken into consideration as well when we think of all of these different treatment options. So I'd like to go into some uh, local injections now. The benefits of treating the thyroid eye disease locally are that you really mitigate the systemic side effects. So you can do an injection of corticosteroids directly into the orbit. This is particularly helpful in patients who have a lot of orbital pain or ache and a lot of uh, inflammatory features. And it has the benefit, of course, of not having the systemic side effects. That being said, it's also not risk-free. Anytime you inject anything with a particle into the face, you run the risk of injecting it into a blood vessel inadvertently, and that can cause a problem. Um, fortunately, that's very rare, but it is still a risk to be aware of. Now, this is also something I've picked up during fellowship in Los Angeles. As you can imagine, we have a lot of patients coming in for filler, and so we always have filler around. And you can use this in thyroid eye disease, particularly for patients with upper eyelid retraction. Um, you know, this is the same filler that people get injected in their cheeks and in their lips. And instead you can inject it into the plane of the muscle that retracts and lifts up the upper eyelid to stretch it down. Now, she doesn't have a perfect cosmetic result there by any means, but this is a good temporizing solution that you can do when somebody's in the active phase the filler eventually dissolves you know, over the course of nine to 12 months. And so hopefully by then they're out of the active phase and you can manage whatever residual eyelid uh, malposition there is with surgery. The last thing I'm going to talk about uh, in the non-surgical management is radiotherapy. Ideal candidates for radiotherapy are people who are at the early part of the active phase and have moderate to severe disease. Radiotherapy is particularly useful if there's significant motility deficiency and progressive strabismus. And generally we use radiotherapy in combination with corticosteroids. So let's quickly get into the surgical management and rehabilitation in thyroid eye disease. In general, we think of this as a progressive um, style of management. So we generally begin by addressing the orbit first because orbital surgery has a risk of causing or changing the strabismus. And so you don't wanna to have to go back and forth several times. So orbit first, then any eye muscle surgery, and finally the eyelids. The one caveat of this is that none of those things seem to really affect the upper eyelid position. And so oftentimes to simplify things for patients will combine upper eyelid retraction surgery with their orbital surgery. So beginning with the orbit, the first and most uh, easy thing, I suppose, to decompress is the fat. That being said, it's not a completely free lunch. There is definitely a limit to how much fat you can remove from the eye socket without causing problems to the other structures. And so I think the fat decompression is something that's ideal for someone who has very, very mild disease or a small amount of asymmetry, say maybe just one millimeter difference in proptosis between the two eyes. Now, of course, bone is the other option for decompression. And the lateral wall is really our workhorse for this surgery. We remove all of the bone back in between the eye socket and the brain to allow the eye socket to expand into that potential space. So if you look on this CT scan here, the bone that's colored in green is what we remove during surgery. And there is some minimally invasive sort of techniques to be able to do this through a very small incision that's hidden in your eyelid crease. The other option for decompression is the medial wall. And so this decompresses the orbit or allows it to expand into the sinus. Now, we often choose the lateral wall over the medial wall when patients only need one because there's a lower risk of causing double vision. For my patients undergoing lateral decompression, I tell them there's about a 5% risk of double vision after surgery, but that risk increases to somewhere in the 15% range for the medial wall. 
But in certain instances, you don't have much of a choice depending on what the individual goals for surgery are and how much you need to move the eye back. And if you need to move the eye back a lot, like more than four or five millimeters, you're gonna be decompressing the lateral wall, the medial wall and the floor. Strabismus surgery often follows orbital decompression. Some uh, oculoplastic surgeons perform strabismus surgery and others will refer you to a pediatric ophthalmologist who mainly does eye muscle surgery. And then finally, we talked about the upper eyelids. So this patient had an upper eyelid retraction surgery. You can see that it lowered her eyelids and also improved the contour. And lower eyelid retraction, we talked earlier about one of the reasons, because when the eye becomes more proptotic, the lower eyelid has to climb up the hill. But the alternate reason is that the middle layer of the eyelid can contract and become fibrotic in thyroid eye disease. And so when that's the case, you can open up that middle layer as is shown here and insert a little graft in that space. And that helps to allow the lower eyelid to sit at a higher position. And so this is a patient who underwent all of those procedures. So she had bilateral three wall decompression, upper eyelid retraction and lower eyelid retraction surgery, and of course, strabismus. And you can see she has quite a good cosmetic outcome at the, at the end. So in summary, thyroid eye disease is diagnosed based on constellation of signs and symptoms, no one particular thing and no one specific diagnostic test. TED typically occurs within 18 months of uh, the systemic diagnosis of a thyroid condition. And management is generally based on both disease stage and grade. In terms of active disease, the goal is really to improve symptomatology and comfort and to get you through into that inactive period where we can begin rehabilitation. And then of course, the grade of disease helps to guide our management. And so taking all of these things into consideration will allow you to customize an approach for management of thyroid eye disease. For somebody who has active mild disease, supportive therapy might be the best. For someone with active moderate, there are many medical options that are open to you. And then for someone who has inactive severe, generally we're thinking surgery, but occasionally some medicines can also be helpful. And of course, there are a multitude of combinations uh, in and amongst um, those options as well. So thank you so much for your attention and for the opportunity to speak today. I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rolos, uh, for a very uh, interesting and informative presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Anista to uh, look after our Q&A section and um, basically uh, um, go through some of the uh, questions that have been provided uh, by, our re by our listeners. Anista? Yes, so thank you, Dr. Olaf, for that excellent informative presentation. Um, so our first question is, um, is there a genetic component to thyroid eye disease? What an excellent question. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if there is, but we don't know about it yet. So thyroid eye disease, even though, you know, I see it commonly, I see it every day, and it's not that infrequent that people have mild disease. In general, it's still a relatively rare entity. And so I think the future, especially, you know, as we're doing more biobanking and more precision medicine, um, will hold some insights into the genetic predispositions. But that's an excellent question. Um, not yet, but maybe in five years, we'll know more on that subject. Okay, thank you. Um, and our second question um, is, I am being followed for early dry macular degeneration by ocular coherence tomography in one eye. Um, there seems to be a strong family history. Have there been any recent developments in this area of ophthalmology? Yeah, that's also an excellent question. Um, you know, probably three or four years ago when I was a resident, I would be better poised to answer that question. Um, but it's been a long time now since I dealt with a patient with macular degeneration. That being said, it sounds like the absolutely right thing is being done. And if you have dry AMD and they're following you with OCT, what they're doing is monitoring for whether it becomes wet. And of course, there are treatments for wet AMD. There's also some research going on into various subtypes of dry AMG, like geographic atrophy, but I think those are all still in sort of investigational and experimental stages, as far as I'm concerned anyways. 
Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, are there any preventative measures one can take for thyroid eye disease? Really excellent question. I think my number one answer for that is don't smoke. Um, don't be around smoking, you know, try to really just avoid any exposure to secondhand smoke, because that is the only thing in all of the studies that have been done that's really been flushed out as a important risk factor for developing thyroid eye disease and also for developing more severe disease. Um, you know, some people would recommend things like the anti-inflammatory diet. My struggle with that is that I don't think there's a great base of evidence to suggest that. But eating healthy and you know staying well from that standpoint is not going to be of harm to you. So if you're really looking for everything you can do, I think that would be a reasonable thing to also incorporate into your life. Great, thank you. Um, is there any correlation between TED and glaucoma? Also a great question. Um, you know, in terms of like a history of TED and glaucoma, I would say no, but certainly in people who have active TED, especially cases that have a lot of congestion, the pressure in the orbit increases. And that can translate to increased pressure on the nerve and increased pressure in the eye. So certainly I have patients that I've put on glaucoma drops who have active thyroid eye disease because I don't want them to develop optic nerve damage from that high pressure over time. But you know, in terms of inactive or mild thyroid eye disease and glaucoma, there's no known association there. Right. Thank you. Um, this seems to be our last question uh, by Marilyn. By smoking, are you meaning tobacco only? Yeah, tobacco is what the um, evidence is for. Evidence in terms of vaping and you know marijuana and some of those other things has not really been well studied yet. So what I'm referring to that has really strong evidence is for tobacco from cigarette smoke. Um, the rest is sort of under investigation presently. Thank you. And let me just check the chat in case um, the questions went over there. Um, oh, yes, I think I see one. How would it come about that a person is in the inactive phase and have severe symptoms? Would this be due to lack of correct diagnosis? Not necessarily. Um, you know, some people are able to make it through thyroid eye disease without needing surgery, meaning that either they responded to medical treatment with corticosteroids um, or they didn't want to have surgery. And so severe disease can be defined by a number of different things. If you have really severe proptosis, you know, where your eyes come forward a whole centimeter more than they should, that can persist throughout the active phase into the inactive phase. And so even though you don't have the inflammatory features anymore, you can still have the sequelae of severe disease um, if it hasn't been specifically addressed or managed yet. That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, one last question, it seems. Um, do you have any advice on finding an appropriate doctor to get help? Great question. I, I think yeah. I think if you are worried that you might have thyroid eye disease, um, your family doctor is a great place to start. You know, when I was a resident, I did a lot of lectures for the family medicine residents. And so they're definitely aware of thyroid eye disease and, you know, can help direct you to the appropriate people. A general ophthalmologist is also a great place to start. You know, they're able to monitor you for some of the important things like uh, dysthyroid optic neuropathy. And then, you know, most thyroid eye disease, especially in the United States, but also in Canada is eventually managed by an oculoplastic surgeon. So that's somebody who's done additional fellowship training, looking specifically at conditions that affect the eyelids and the eye socket. And so that person eventually would be someone who will help rehabilitate you. But if you have mild symptoms and mild disease, I think your family doctor can be helpful or a general ophthalmologist would be kind of like the next level up from that. And some optometrists also are very um, knowledgeable when it comes to thyroid eye disease. So it really depends on the severity of your symptoms um, and also which phase of disease you're in. If you're in the active phase, of course, you should be monitored more frequently. And as long as you're being monitored appropriately, you know, somebody is checking your vision, checking your color vision, 
Um, I think that that's totally appropriate and a number of people can do that very well. That was great. Thank you so much for answering all our questions. That should no problem. be problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hanista, for, for uh, putting, putting together all those questions for us. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Kelsey Rollins for giving us her presentation on thyroid eye disease. We would like to show our appreciation by awarding uh, Dr. Rollins with a two-year membership to the Thyroid Foundation. I would also like to thank our webinar team for making this educational event a success. I'd like to mention that if you have some spare time and would like to volunteer to help others with thyroid disease virtually from home, uh, please call us on our helpline at 1-800-267-8822 or email us at info at thyroid.ca. You can also assist us by becoming a member or making a donation by visiting our website at thyroid.ca. As you exit the session, please take a moment to complete our short survey. It will help us improve future webinars. Our next webinars will start again next fall. All of us at the Thyroid Foundation in Canada hope to see you again soon. We hope you and your families are well and keeping safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Dr. you so much for having me. Have a good day. Thank you. you too.